And folks, welcome back to another episode of the Podcast Digest. My name is Dan Lizette. Thank you guys again for joining me, and I hope you've enjoyed the recent episodes uh, with the interviews and the recent uh, recommendation show. Hope you guys are finding new great things for your subscription list. And that's what, of course, we're here to talk about, and I'm really happy to be joined by my guest this week in another show that is very different in something that I think must be on your subscription list. It's been on mine since it joined Radiotopia several months back, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dave Nadelberg from Mortified. Dave, welcome to the Podcast Digest. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much for uh, coming on. I know we've been uh, talking for a little bit. I've uh, enjoyed Mortified for uh, a number of months now since it's been a part of Radiotopia. But this is a show like no other that I've talked about so far in the Podcast Digest, and I imagine those who haven't listened yet probably haven't heard before. For those unfamiliar, can you tell them a little bit about Mortified? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's uh, so Mortified, the Mortified podcast, I should say, uh, takes recordings from the Mortified stage shows all across uh, uh, North America, uh, where adults read their most embarrassing childhood writings, things like their love letters, their old diaries, their poetry, and they share it in front of total strangers. Which obviously makes for a lot of interesting stories. <laughs> yeah, and what's fun about and what's fun about the the podcast also is that whereas the stage show is just people reading and sharing their their childhood writings, the podcast we get to um, go one step further actually, and uh, there's an interview segment after each episode where um, we kind of find out uh, some more unusual facts and and. Um, you know, get really get into the neuroses of why these people wrote what they wrote when they were 13. And I wanted to talk about that. But before I get to that, I wanted to ask, who came up with the idea of the post-mortem fide? <laughs> that little reference for that section label. <laughs> Uh, okay. Do you mean you mean who? You mean who came up with the title "Post Mortified"? Or <laughs> yeah, I just I just thought it was a unique segue to the to the uh, interview section you mentioned. Uh, that was my dumb pun. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think we were calling it. We had like a whole bunch of different names, and then at some point, you know, that stuck or whatever. But um, and we just weren't sure if it was too dopey. <laughs> oh, I think it's great. I look forward to every single episode. <laughs> you like that? Okay, yeah. good. Well, that's our first feedback, literally. On there that, you go. Uh, I that think that it's has hilarious. ever generated a laugh in somebody outside of our uh, editor. Well, let's let's go back a little bit, Dave. Let's yeah. go all the way back. So let's talk about the history of Mortified. Long, this was uh, something else long before it was ever a podcast. Can you take us back to sort of the beginning of this production, how this idea even started? Because obviously sure. it's a unique concept to have somebody take their childhood writings and perform them or read them in front of strangers, basically. How did this all come about? Well, uh, over 13 years ago, I um, started doing this stage show uh, in Los Angeles um, where, you know, uh, as I mentioned, where adults read their childhood writings and all that came from um, a, lo- a love letter that I'd written in high school and, and found as an adult and started sharing with strangers. And I realized that uh, the kid who wrote that was a total idiot, but I, I kind of liked his idiocy. <laughs> and um, so I, and I, I'm not a performer at all, but uh, I decided to, I, you know, I, everyone has that bug. And so that you want to kind of share that with, with people. And so I invited people to do the same. And um, um, soon we started doing stage shows and uh, books and, and then stage shows, not just in Los Angeles, but in uh, multiple cities from New York to San Francisco, Austin, etc. cetera. Um, and and it, it quickly stopped being um, just me. Um, and, and right now, uh, you know, Mortified has, you know, people all over the country um, who, you know, spend a lot of time and love working on the project. But um, but the project overall is run by myself, as well as Neil Ketcher, who's the other host you, you, you hear on the show. And we're both um, producing the thing with, uh, with a guy named Pierce, who produces our Austin chapter, as well as uh, two... Uh, Two radio people, uh, Kathy and Gina, out here in Los Angeles. So it's a it's a it's a multi headed hydra. <laughs> Back at the beginning, when you had this idea to start reading the stories from this idiot <laughs> that you kind of yeah. liked, 
And yeah. you started to approach other people and decided, you know, could this be its own thing? Some of those first conversations, I'm curious how those went. When you first started to approach people and say, here's what I've done. Would you like to do it too? How did this start to be received? Uh, I think, you know, people were, people were like, yeah, that sounds fun. I, I don't think they knew what to necessarily expect. And that's fair because I didn't know what to expect. I know that I was terrified before the first Mortified stage show. Um, I, I remember distinctly being backstage and like my biggest fear was that this is funny for five minutes. This is a cute idea, sharing your past in front of strangers. But once we hear it for just a few minutes, it's like, okay, how much, like, why is this continue to be interesting? Plus, like, maybe it's funny if you know the person, but if you don't know the person. And and what was really fun is that it's actually way more enjoyable when you don't know the person. And that everybody has a unique and different life. And even though there's tons of similarities in a lot of our pieces and definitely in, in, in some of the episodes you've you've heard on the podcast, what's really fun is that they all have I, I think every life goes in different directions and um uh I don't know, you get to really hear like what's not just uh, common about everybody, but what's really unique about everybody and special. So that's that's been, you know, two of the I think one of the elements that Neil and I have been really most proud of, especially in the in the podcast episodes so far. Um, and I think you can see it. I, one thing I didn't mention is over, over the years, in addition to the stage shows and books, we've, um, we did a television show briefly that was more of a talk show uh, for two seasons on the Sundance channel called The Mortified Sessions. And then we released a movie about a year ago called Mortified Nation that you can watch on Netflix. Nice. Or iTunes. Yeah. Nice. I think I saw a reference to that on the website when I was putting together my notes for a conversation today and made a note that that was something I needed to go check out for sure. Uh, in those Back in those early days again, so you put together those first couple of stage shows. What was the audience reaction like? Because I'm going to assume at this point any audience hadn't really heard much along these lines. I mean, I know there's a whole bunch of spoken word performances and stage shows, and I'm sure they'd heard something related, but sort of a whole set, if you will, of thematically, you know, these sort of awkward, embarrassing stories from the childhood. What was the reception like? Um, yeah, sorry. I think, I think I failed to answer that before. Um, the reception was really fantastic. Uh, people, people were really supportive of it and they felt like there's something, New here. That was sort of the dawn of the storytelling movement. So the moth, you know, was already going, and this American life was certainly already going. But they weren't the cultural forces that they had become. And certain, and same with TED and TED Talks and all that stuff. So the storytelling movement was sort of percolating, and at the time was called, typically called spoken word or lit salons or something. And um, I think people saw this as an extension of that, but they. Felt like there's something new, and it wasn't comedy, but it wasn't theater, and it wasn't like performance art, but it was sort of somewhere in between a lot of those things, and it wasn't spoken word. And I think it was this I thought that um, there's something exciting and new in something that's totally old and outdated, meaning childhood writings uh, that are written by hand, no less. <laughs> Let me ask you this one here, uh, because I'm really curious. How, now that the, the, the stage show, sort of as we're going through chronology here, the, the stage show is up and running, how does it get out of where you started, which I'm going to assume somewhere in California, L.A., were the first few? or Yeah. yeah. So how does it go to multiple sites, and how does this kind of expansion start to occur? You've mentioned books and TV shows and movies, how does it come from this sort of L.A. centric stage show and get to those type of levels? Well, uh, the the film was a completely independent thing that we did. Um, uh, the TV also came out of the independent thing. We, it was the TV was project we did for Sundance Channel was actually a spinoff of something we had done online that that uh, we got on their radar and they were like, "Ooh, we like this weird interview thing you've you've done online. Can you do more of those?" And we're like, "Sure." Um, but as far as the stage show expansion, 
you know, our, our show is very curated. It's not an open mic show. And so it's really just about us going to different cities and, you know, running a workshop or just training a, a local team. What makes bad writing good writing? Um, and it turns out there's a lot of nuances to that. And so that, which is actually part of the fun. So you guys start to get exposed in other cities and folks start to find out more and more about what you guys are doing. And you mentioned it's not an open mic night. What is that process like where people start to raise their hand and say, consider me in these stories? And what is sort of the selection? How do you guys choose who ends up on that stage? Well, um, yeah, I mean, that's a whole, you actually, if you check out Mortified Nation, the the documentary that we kind of go into it a little bit there, but, um, it's basically people show up, uh, they, they say, Hey, well, I want to participate. They go to getmortified.com. We meet with pretty much everybody if, if we can, uh, in each city. Uh, we have local teams in each city who do that. And once we meet with somebody, we basically, we walk them through we 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 listen to some of their childhood writings and we we try to help them find excerpts that will that we, we know our audience is going to love and once we find enough of those excerpts um you know we we invite them to go on stage but it's that's a real simplification of it but it's um but that's that's the basics and um as i said there's a lot of nuances it turns out into what makes bad writing interesting because the first show or the, I should say p- before the first show I thought this would take me about two weeks to whip together <laughs> and I was it, it took months and months and months and the reason was the first person who I met with who said oh yeah I've got stuff is this girl Elizabeth and I went up to Elizabeth I went over to Elizabeth's place and I listened to some of her diaries and I within about 15 minutes realized uh oh this is not a good idea because most of the stuff she was reading me was really it was cute, but it wasn't really funny. And I was like, "What? when does this stuff become funny? And when does it just become sort of outstaying its welcome? Or um, like, I, just, I, I really didn't want it to be like exhibitionism. Like, a, you know what I mean? Like, or pure, ex- obviously there's an element that is that, but I, I just don't want it to be some narcissistic thing of like, look at me. So I want it to genuinely be entertaining to the audience. So um, I had a really... You know, and it's a process that we've evolved over the years, but really trying to figure out um, what of that strange childhood writing can be funny and and, and be entertaining and, and sometimes even moving to total strangers. And that's a great segue to my next question, really. And I don't even know if this is a great question, Dave, and you can tell me if it's not. I'm fine it's with it. It's the best question ever. So these elements that you talked about, and those are some of the ones that I've heard in the podcast ever since, and that is some of them are hilarious. Some of them are awkward. Some of them are, I don't want to say, you know, uh, there's a shock element to it, but there is this (laughs) kind of rawness or nakedness to the fact that somebody's on stage telling this. Have you guys found that any of these particular elements work better? Are there ones that you like more than others? Or or does any of that really come into the decision-making process of putting somebody on stage? Um, all, the only thing that gets put into the decision-making process of, of does somebody get on stage is, is this something that our audience is going to enjoy? Did we find enough material? Did we find enough excerpts from their diaries, love letters, and poems that are that are accidentally funny enough, and um, and it's not it's not an audition. We don't care about their talent, but it's just you know once we find enough stuff, we give it that green light. Our hope is, of course, that that um, uh, that is you know somewhat unique, and and that we can um, so that they don't all sound the same. So in the so in the case of the podcast, for instance, um, you know the first episode is uh first two episodes are, are sort of you know what you might expect from a show like this like a guy who writes a love letter to a girl and it goes disastrous or the diary of a girl who um you know who has a who's in love with this boy and she's not allowed to date him and those are the first two episodes of our show but then you know a couple episodes later it's uh this guy who's this pretentious poet or there's a guy who's like obsessed with star trek and and women at the same time and doesn't uh, really get that that's not something women aren't into. And, you know, we have um, a guy who wrote a play. So, you know, ideally we, we you, you just want to 
be able to make sure things stay on their toes and, and stay uh, eclectic. You mentioned storytelling, and I'm curious if this is something that's a consideration for the stage or maybe just the podcast. What about the speaker's uh, ability to tell a story? Because I know on the podcast, there have been several really excellent story. I mean, like pacing and tone and just like they've delivered this many times and it's it just hits all the right tones is is that something you look for in terms of the live show or just the podcast or or neither we really don't look for performance talent um i mean you need to be able to speak and you need you absolutely need to be likable right um but i mean you just need to be good at playing yourself and we'll help you with the rest and uh, in, in terms of the performance stuff, everything comes down to the content. Everything comes down to the, the material. We work with them. We we uh, to um, you know each piece. In addition to diaries, is you'll hear some sort of context like, "Hi, I'm Kevin, and when I was 12, my parents were divorced, and I was obsessed with the girl next door." And here are my diary entries chronicling that. Like you'll hear that kind of context, and that we've collaborated with every single performer on. And sometimes it's. You know, you mentioned about how many times they perform. Like some of them, it's their first time ever, and some of them have done it before. But yeah, and so we really, we really uh, don't look for their performance ability. In fact, I prefer when people are have no performance experience. Um, that said, we've obviously we also have actors and 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 stand ups who sometimes do our show. But um, I always find what you do as an adult is more incidental to how well you'll do on stage. Speaking of actors, I just want to make mention, and I don't have the link right in front of me. Just when you said the word actors, it made me think about it, so I'm not prepared for this. But there was an episode a couple back where yeah. it was one reading, and then you had two actors performing the Correct. reading. Oh, that was excellent. Oh, <laughs> I really enjoyed that. that one. That was so great where... So what you're referring to, I guess for your listeners, so what he's referring to is the... Um, uh, we did an episode with a guy named Heath and, um, uh, Heath wrote a play when he was a kid and then we got two actors to bring that play to life. And those actors are Adam Bush and Amber Benson, um, who sometimes, uh, love to help us bring plays to life. Uh, they were both on, uh, the television show, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, and that particular recording was done at sort of a, a Comic-Con event in New York City, um, so, uh, that we were doing like all sci-fi, you know, themed pieces or people in the show. Um, and actually, um, in a couple weeks from the air date of this interview, we'll be doing, um, an episode with, uh, Retta, who you might know as Donna, the treat yourself woman from the television show Parks and Rec, oh, yes. um, where sh she'll be reading aloud her own. Uh, very nerdy diaries. <laughs> and the one we were talking about, I just, now I pulled it up, is episode 11, Heath, Lesser Than Zero, was the episode, yeah. if I remember correctly. And what was so interesting about that was, he was kind of, if I recall correctly, like a mini director, and he was verbalizing, <laughs> like, the, the, the breaks, you know, pause, or whatever it was he kept yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. I he couldn't over... stop laughing when he was doing that. <laughs> it was hilarious. Yeah, it's really... I, it's really fun when we, you know, every once in a while we'll do plays and 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 books and stuff like that that kids wrote, um, in, in in Mortified. Typically, it's it's you know diaries and letters, but it's really fun when we get to do plays and songs and things of that nature. Uh, and we have a play. Well, we actually have a screenplay coming up the week that the new Jurassic Park movie comes out, which I think is June eighth. Well, that's the, that's the week of our episode. Uh, so around June 8th, we're going to be doing an episode recorded in Austin where a guy wrote his own Jurassic Park sequel when he was like 15. Oh, boy. Um, and, but his, his involves Barney the Dinosaur <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, some other strange elements. So it is, it is not the version of uh, – it's, it's not on par with the Chris Pratt movie that's coming out this summer. But uh, – but anyway, so that'll the same week that the move the big movie comes out, uh, we're putting out our little tiny Jurassic Park. That that will be excellent. And folks, this is why I wanted so badly to talk with Dave and talk about Mortified because if you're not listening to this show, 
put it in your subscription list, and I promise you every single episode is so unique, so different, and if you're even mildly interested in what we're talking about here, you've got to check these episodes out because it's something like you haven't heard before, and it will make you go to GetMortified.com to see if there's a live show coming near you, and you know maybe even dig into your shoeboxes buried in your closet to see if you've got something that you might want to contribute. It's a uh, it's a really unique concept and something I've been completely intrigued about since since it started. So take us from okay, you're doing this run of live shows, Dave, and you somebody has the idea, you somebody else in the group or whatever, that maybe this could be a podcast. What was that decision like? How did the acquaintance with Radiotopia come right. about, and what was that process like? Okay, well I'll answer that in two ways. So uh, pieces get picked for the podcast. Um, Largely by two people, which is uh, Pierce Persali, who's our, who's uh, one of our producers for our stage show in, in um, Austin, as well as Neil uh, Neil Ketcher, and they're usually the first two gateway um, people who kind of you know who've been sifting through stuff and hear stuff, and they go, "Oh, that'd be good." Um, and really, we're just looking for like what stands out, what's what's unique, and. Um, What's fun, and we're also trying to. We do shows in ten cities, uh, though that's about to expand even more into Europe and, and other places. And so we're also trying to make sure, you know, we're in LA for a week, and then Boston for a week, and then the next week we're in San Francisco. Um, so we're really trying to um, uh, feature content from all over all over uh, the country. Uh, as far as the Radiotopia um, thing came about, that was interesting. We were. Um, some some fun gossip was we were um, we were in talks with uh, I'll just say it I don't care uh, with Amazon what do I care anymore um, to to possibly do something and um, that we ultimately just didn't like where they were heading for uh, for our you know for our own needs and so we decided to you know what let's let's do something different and we. Um, you know, we were looking into Nerdist and Earwolf and all the all the different podcast networks. We're doing it or, or doing it on our own and all that. And I think Neil had seen something about Radiotopia, and I had heard a little bit about it in the past. I was like, "What is that again?" And then we looked into it. and We're like, "This is this is our home. This is like perfect for us." And literally, I I didn't know anybody there. I wrote to their website where I wrote like to their customer support right, thing the contact I said, us email. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I said, look, we've actually, we do the show and our show has been on tons of, uh, public radio shows. We've been on this American life and, you know, all things considered and all these things that seem like that were in their wheelhouse. And I, and they wrote us back and they wrote us back from within the customer support, you know, system. So our first like five or six exchanges with them was like tech support. Um, <laughs> it was like literally through this thread that had come through their website. So it was a very, it was totally organic in that like it wasn't through any real connection. And the more we read about them, the more we were like, these, these guys are the right, these are, these guys are a really great fit for Mortified and they don't have comedy. And, um, and we're, you know, well, they do have comedy, but like they don't have anything that's, I think, that would get sold, uh, you know what I mean? Like uh, pr promoted as comedy. Right. Um, at least at the time they didn't. Um, and so we're like, oh, maybe we can offer like a, a slightly different flavor. Um, uh, so, so yeah. So um, that was, uh, that was, we're really happy, and and uh, everyone that we've met over at, at Radiotopia, there's a, there's a guy there named John Barth, who's who deals with all their productions, or at least, uh, and he really has become a point person for us, and um, he's sort of our public radio Sherpa, um, because they really approach everything with a with a with a public radio mindset, and um, so it, I don't know if it, it they've really held our hand through the process and uh it's it, that has been the happiest part like re, it's not, I, I, that has been the best decision we made in terms of this that's excellent and 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 all my listeners have heard me talk about radiotopia for a while now i've had the privilege of 
interviewing a couple other hosts of great shows up as a part of that network and, and recommended a couple others in, in my recommendation episodes. And uh, yeah. folks, anyone who has, you know, most of your podcast apps will have a network button, uh, you know, where you can see all the shows associated with Radiotopia. And you should find that, uh, be it the podcast apps and iTunes or Pocket Cast or whatever you're listening on, and just take a look through the list. And, and you can literally close your eyes and click on one, and I bet you will love what you find. And uh, Radiotopia is doing great work, and that definitely includes bringing Mortified on board. And um, you know, I'm I'm a huge fan of of all the things that those guys are doing over there, and uh, it's it, it really is an impressive roster. And and our decision to even do the the podcast, you know, it's it's it was something we talked about for years, but it really it's a beast. Um, it's like, as you know, doing your own podcast, it can be a lot of work and our particular podcast just has a lot of layers because there's, there's live event audio that, that needs to be recorded and then edited. And then there's sort of host wraparounds. And so we kind of have like a lot of layers to our production. And so we just wanted to make sure we could, we were like, we could do it on our own, but we'd really rather do it with somebody who can help us. Um, you know, help provide an editor or something like that. Um, give us some resources, and um, most of the most of the radio networks or most of the podcast networks, at least at the time that we were talking to, most of them were just like, oh, they won't give you know, they wouldn't give you anything. And the and this company really understood, and I think Gimlet and some of the other companies now are are are, also, are, are other examples of it. Which is great, which is they're like, no, you do need to put a lot of, you can get a lot of great reward and great content if you're putting a lot of effort and resources into, in, into the production. Um, cause I think there was a while where every podcast thought it needed to be a comedian interviewing another comedian. Right. Um, and while there are some really great shows that do that, most shows should not be that, you know, and so it's obviously serial, which I'm sure you've talked about far too many times on your show, but serial changed all that because right. it said, what if we put like <laughs> a budget in it? And what if we, you know, and, and it really showed that like podcasts can be talk shows, which are great. And pod show podcasts can be documentary series and podcasts can, and, and, you know, the moth, which, you know, we're certainly in the mold of, um, you know, showed that that it can be somewhere in between live performance and doc, and um, so um, I really, I mean, I, I I think we're in an exciting time for this medium because uh, I just think suddenly all these doors are opening. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, and it's well said in terms of what uh, has been happening lately and the. New entrance and the variety and quality of the variety that's been being put out there now. And, and your show is one of the ones at the top of the list that I would point to in terms of folks who want to get away from that standard interview show like this one or, or like a lot of others. No no, that, no. no, no, no. You're right, though. I mean, there are a ton of shows doing this same exact type of thing, right? There, there are yep. a number of sort of same format, if you will. Uh, and yes, that's but I, I need I need I, I need to I need to clarify so that it's like <laughs> um, that is not saying I'm not talking about interview as a as a genre. I meant specifically every week for about a like I think it was like after Mark Marin hit <laughs> right. suddenly there was like every other minute there was a new uh, another comedian going I'm going to interview another comedian uh, about the trajectory of their career. Well, I and, think all comedians and I'm have saying podcasts, those, And I'm saying there was like maybe 10 of those that were great, but there was like a hundred of them. Yeah. And um, I think it created uh, a movement that, that helped us get to where there was even an appetite for things like cereal. And then I, I, I really think, I don't know. I, I really think that that podcast um, for as much as people talk about it and hype it, I think it was really, earned hype and i think um it's the reason you and i can talk is because things like that uh, i think are opening doors for smaller and emerging shows like like ours absolutely um, 
Absolutely. I wanted to go back to something you said a minute ago, Dave. You talked about the production process. And I was really curious about how that happened because your show does have a lot of different parts, right? You've got ad reads, you've got intros, you've got the live audio, you've got interviews, uh, you know, with the host. What is it like? How long does this take? What is the process like beyond sort of the selection of what you feature, but then putting together an episode? Take us through what that process is like. Um, That process is long. (laughs) Um, You know what? I haven't had to quantify that. Um, Neil might then be able to quantify it quicker than I could, but it, I mean the, the, you know, it'd be really hard to answer because the, the components are, we record the, we meet with somebody, they, we eventually work with them to get into the stage show then. And that could be, you know, a couple weeks or sometimes even months. Um, then they get in the stage show. We record the stage show, and then we event. Then eventually, that audio floats its way to Los Angeles, where where, where Neil, myself, and and Pierce listen to it and go, "Oh, that one. We should we should put that one in in into the mix." And um, you know, and from there, uh, it goes through this journey that I couldn't quantify the hours, but you know, it I could quantify that it probably takes about two months once we get it uh, or once we've, you know, but with a lot of off and on because we're working on tons of episodes at once. Um, That's a harder answer to question. That's a harder question to answer, I should say. Do you ever find somebody that came to a live show, did a great job, you guys liked what would happen and you wanted to feature it on the podcast, but for some reason they didn't want to come back and talk about sort of what's happened since? Uh, no one has turned us down to do the post-mortem fied interviews, but, um, but if they didn't want to do it, that would be fine. We, we'd, uh, we would just, you know, we would, we would do something else for the second half of the episode. Um, in fact, we have a, a fun summer camp episode, um, coming out soon. Uh, well, I'm not sure what it'll be, but, um, we're considering doing this episode where we're going to do like two pieces themed around something um, where there might, you know, not be an interview or something. So um, like we're, we're, we're considering ways of playing with a format. And when you have been able to go back and talk to these folks, generally it seems like people are ready and willing to talk about this again, so to speak, and kind of give you guys the update have, how long are these conversations? I imagine there's editing involved in and in that end of things too, right? Yeah, there's. That's honestly, <laughs> that is such a time uh, a time hole. Like it is, it is um, transcribing interviews and um, and then um, and then editing those. That becomes like this giant uh, beast, which is why we like I said, we really wanted to find a partner. That could that could help us sort of handle some of those things, and, and um, you know, because uh, we really felt like that would be the best way to go. Do you feel over the course of time, Dave? We've talked about things from you know this idea that you had to these stage shows that expanded to multiple cities, to documentaries, to uh, podcasts, to movies. Do you ever feel like this is kind of exploded further than you ever envisioned was this ever in your mind's eye 13 years ago no i mean this was supposed to be a one night experiment <laughs> on stage in los angeles um and this was not supposed to be me talking to dan lazette in, in uh, on the east coast 13 years later uh about it on as a podcast which wasn't even a word that existed right um in my vocabulary back then i don't think it existed in anyone's vocabulary yeah so, um, yeah, so that's, that's been like a whole, uh, that's, that's been one of the great joys is this notion of like, did you ever think, you know, I think I felt that when we did our first book and then I felt that when we did our, um, television project and when, when we had done, you know, our second book or, or a movie, you know, the documentary and, um, Every step of the way, it's like this all came from a love letter to a girl, <laughs> you know. And so that's that's what's neat is like you write this letter to get a connection with somebody, 
and I didn't give it to her. And the whole hook is that um, by giving it to strangers, I wound up never getting that girl. I don't even know what happened to her. I was 15 at the time. And, but I, you wind up getting a connection with, you know, millions of people. That's really exciting. Um, that, I mean, that's just mind-blowing to me. What do you think this girl would say if you somehow were able to tell her <laughs> what this letter kick-started over uh, the next decade and a half? Get away, creep. <laughs> um, I mean, I have, uh, I, yeah, I've, I've looked her up on Facebook a little bit, but I, um, I'm ultimately, I kind of like that I have no idea what happened to her. And I like, and I'm, and I'm, I think I'd be also weird. I, I'm leery of being like, hi, I have a job because of my crush on you when I was 14. Like, I, I don't know if that would just absolutely creep somebody out where they're like, does that mean you still like, no, I don't like you. I'm a 40 year old man. Leave me alone. <laughs> it would but, seem like uh, in parts of, if I was in your position, I think I would just have to have like one cup of coffee just to say, look, you know, I never gave this to you, but it meant this for my future. And yeah, you I'm know, sure, I'm sure she would be thrilled uh, on some level and like <laughs> weirded out on another. Um, so yeah, it's been, that's, that's certainly something that's always floating in the back of one's of, of my brain uh of like man if that girl ever knew but i i have no idea i have i i have no idea what happened to her that sounds like a future mortified movie hypothetically if you guys yeah. were to come into contact and arrange this coffee like somebody has to fire up a camera and, and follow you through this whole process of this conversation <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it would be, uh, it would be very neat to, uh, to reunite, um, at, under those circumstances of telling somebody, um, you know, but it, uh, yeah, <laughs> but so, it also makes me uncomfortable, yeah. clearly. <laughs> and isn't that sort of what Mortified's about in a lot of That's ways? exactly what it's about. So I'm, I'm okay with that discomfort. <laughs> So you mentioned some expansion to Europe coming up soon, more live shows yeah. in Europe. And that was uh, one of the last things I wanted to talk to you about, Dave. You right. guys have done so many things already in terms of various different you know, um, venues or channels of getting these stories out to the world. What are some of your future plans for Mortified that you see coming next year or two? Um, well... We are going to be launching some European cities uh, in the near future. We actually just did a show in Amsterdam. Um, and I'm also working on a project uh, in Mexico. Um, so that will be our first all Spanish language show, which would be, you know, just incredible. And it, it one of the fun things about us getting to do these shows in other countries and, and, and also you know, we're, we're coming very soon to Dublin and London and Paris is, um, you know, it really, to me, it really, it really improves that sort of idea of like, no matter where you're from, we're all the same. Right. Um, and, and it really, and I love, so doing it in, in, in other languages, like I, I attended that show in Amsterdam. I didn't understand a damn word of it, you know? <laughs> right. Um, I, I, you know, Neil and I and, and, and some of the people, we trained the, the, the local team there, like how to curate in our, our particular way. And then they, but it was up to them, of course, to, to curate the, the actual Dutch language diaries, which we could only be so helpful with because we don't speak the language. They translated some of it for us. But it was so incredible being in a room and listening to people laugh at someone on stage reading aloud their diaries, where you understand about ten percent of it, right? Um, but but yet but yet you relate in some other weird way, like you can still laugh and you can relate to a hundred percent of it. Like that's, I don't know. That was that was a really uh, it was a pretty incredible experience. And it's got to be even on a deeper level. And I don't mean to get all philosophical about this, but in the sense that Get there. In, in a very Go there. In a very simple way, Dave, like, you know, somebody told me a couple of days ago on Twitter, 
and this is such a minor teeny thing. They they DM'd me and said, hey, I heard about this show because of your review. And I just want to let you know that I'm completely in love with it. And I really thank what you're doing for our community. And that like warmed my heart to all kinds of degrees, thinking that somebody actually mm-hmm. got something real out of it. This was an idea you had over 13 years ago, and now you're sitting in an auditorium in Amsterdam. I mean, that well, is Don't profound. think that wasn't lost on me. You know, I mean, that's... Yeah. I, I don't think anyone even listening to this could even fathom what that feeling is like where you are now... <laughs> you're impacting people across the world with something that started as a what you thought might be a one-off. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and a one-off that began really due to dissatisfaction with sort of the Hollywood system and, and, and entertainment. Like I, I, I was living, I was working out here as sort of a writer and a copywriter. And, um, so there was just a bunch of, and I had sold some TV shows and, um, or pilots and, and, uh, those pilots got shot, which was exciting. And then those pilots died. And the process of making those pilots was, you know, uh, full of a lot of the gross antics that I think you've heard about or seen in like movies about Hollywood culture, um, in terms of like, you know, uh, things changing in a way that doesn't seem to be in the best interest of the project, but more is just about some other sort of nonsense. And um, so it was sort of like creatively disheartening. And in that moment, in that moment of what was seeming failure, um, this other, this, this mortified uh, was born. Uh, it was, it was, I decided, I was like, I want to rent a theater and I want to not have to have a green light from some giant corporation to, to make some people laugh, to entertain some people. Um, I just, yeah, so that that was it. It was that pure. And to see where it's gone over, you know, this much time has just got to fill you with a sense of satisfaction beyond a comprehension. Uh, it does, um, but also with like dread in the sense that, like, I don't know if you've heard. So at least as the the record date of this interview. Um, so the most recent episode we did was uh, as of this recording was episode thirteen. So. Um, I like the, the we do an episode. The episode this week is uh, a guy who's on an airplane, and uh, it's a teenager who's on an airplane, and um, he's writing a diary literally on the airplane about his attraction to the woman in the seat next to him. And it is, I say, dread earlier because it is so uncomfortable, yes. um, and um, of what winds up happening next, um, and his obsession with her, and then sort of the. Uh, the uh, the follow up interview that even happens um, as uh, I don't know it's it's really fun and 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 so anytime there's some sort of like sweet humbling kind of philosophical thing that one can mine out of mortified I just I think back to things like you know episodes or or, or performances like that where it's like yeah but it's all about you know some teenager acting like an idiot and that we enjoy that. Um, in some, in some, on some level, I've heard that episode and it was excellent. And uh, I was like, you, like, oh no, he's gonna do this, really? <laughs> it, <laughs> it's like a, I find his diary that thing, um, to be like a Hitchcock film. It's really one of the most suspenseful <laughs> episodes I think we'll probably ever do because it just has. If you listen to it, obviously you have, but like if your listeners listen to it, they'll they'll hear why, but. Like Neil, Neil was was familiar with it for a while because it had been happened in our, in some of our other shows in other cities, and so he had been telling me about it for years. And I was like, "Oh my God, I want to hear this piece. I want to hear this piece. Like that just sounds so like stressful and cringeworthy and and just mortifying." And so, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, and now and now we finally got to put it in the show. Yeah, I, I think it was an excellent episode. Like so, like all thirteen so far, as you mentioned, the day of this recording will probably be up to fourteen. I think uh, when you folks are listening to this right now, and I'll tell you, Dave, the the, the the conversation has been extraordinary in the sense of 
where this started and where it is today. And it's a very interesting tale, I think, because unlike most folks I've talked to uh, who have either just launched a podcast or just have a podcast brand that they're looking to expand, kind of podcasting has acted like sort of the icing on the cake for you guys. And it's just one more outlet that you guys are able to share with the world. And I know a lot of people are enjoying already, and hopefully a lot more will. And I know a lot of my listeners are podcasters themselves, um, and yeah. I think they will get a lot out of the idea of what you guys have put together, the time, the idea, and what you've been able to build. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the creativity and, and starting out with this idea and, and, and sort of moving on from there. It's it's funny, you make me think I've actually got a guy I went to high school with who's actually in LA right now for the last five years. Him and his cohorts have been trying to self-run their own stand-up comedy show, and they've been building year after year after year. And hearing a story like yours, I swear I'm going to send him this interview and just say, you know, keep at it, man, because, you know, you never know what could be around the corner. Look at this story. Uh, and yeah, I think it's I mean, mortified, mortified is, 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 has, um, has had its ups and downs over the years and triumphs and setbacks, but, um, it is, it is a project marked by tenacity. Uh, um, like even when we're ready to give up on it, it, it just, uh, you know, it just keeps thundering and keeps, um, I don't know, uh, constantly reborn. But I, mean, I, I want to say about the, the icing on the cake as podcast, you know, as, that's kind of how you framed podcasting, which is a very sweet compliment. However, um, while the stage shows are and will always be our focus, um, I got to say the podcast is pretty close behind that nice. more than any film, more than any TV or book or any kind of project. Like this, uh, this is really. Uh, the future of Mortified, and it's really the epicenter um, and of the brand, um, and on on so many levels. So, like, we don't see this as some small thing. We see this as as the thing. Uh, um, as a fan, I love hearing that. <laughs> I really do. Knowing yeah, that well, it is and such people a people like you, so. people like you, like, there's not a lot of people doing like these. Uh, who are just dedicated to sort of covering the world of podcasting. <laughs> um, and so you get to kind of be on the, on the ground floor of that as that grows. But, but people like we, you know, shows like ours can't exist without, um, you know, uh, I think journalists or hosts to uh, putting, putting, you know, new and interesting different um, audio experiences and, and, and shows uh, on people's radars, so I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to, you know, uh, be part of this in any way. Well, I'm trying to be the podcast version of word of mouth, so to speak, and trying to tell a whole bunch of people I know uh, about what I've found. And uh, you know, I think your show uh, that you guys have put together, you and your your whole team. I know there's a lot of people involved in in making this thing happen, and. Uh, you guys are doing phenomenal work, and uh, I really want everybody to hear it. So, Dave, anybody who is intrigued, and folks, I know that you are now. I really hope that you are, and wants to learn more and hear some of these episodes. Can you tell folks where they can find everything? Absolutely. Uh, the number one place you can go to find any kind of mortified content is getmortified.com. Uh, as of the air date of this, I'm hoping our brand new website will have been launched. If it's not... Um, it will be launched very soon. We're supposed to launch a new website very, very soon. Um, but you can also check us out on Twitter at Mortified as well as, uh, on Facebook and you can just look up Facebook, look up Mortified in the Facebook search to find it there. And folks, I'll have links to all of that in the show notes as well. So check that podcast app of choice. You will see links that Dave just mentioned in there as well. Dave, thank you so much for joining me this uh, for this episode. I, I really appreciate your time, and your story is so intriguing to me. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. I really appreciate it. And, folks, that'll do it for this week of the Podcast Digest. I really hope you've enjoyed, and I hope that you will come back again next week for more information, more great show recommendations, more great interviews. My name is Dan Lizette for the Podcast Digest, and I will talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to the Podcast Digest. You can follow the show on Twitter at Pod Digest. 
Like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the podcast digest. Email the show feedback at the podcast digest at gmail.com. And you can find all the previous episodes and exclusive blog entries at the show's website, thepodcastdigest.info.